Hello everyone, welcome back to Gamer Moments. Oblivion is a game. So over the past month I've been playing a lot of the Elder Scrolls Oblivion. Now I've played Skyrim off and on ever since it came out, but Oblivion came out when I was really young and I never really gave it a chance. Instead of making fun of a movie like the last few videos, today I want to talk about Oblivion, what I think of it, a bit of the weirdness of it, and why I think that's what makes it so great. The year is 2005. The revival of Doctor Who airs on the BBC. A little video sharing site called YouTube launches. A bunch of way more important stuff happens. And in May, the highest ever attended E3 happens in Los Angeles. The current generation of consoles are soon to come to an end, and so there's a lot to be seen this year. Microsoft go on MTV with Elijah Wood and The Killers to announce the Xbox 360. Sony, of course, unveil the PlayStation 3. And Nintendo talk about some of the features of their upcoming console, codenamed Nintendo Revolution. But to be honest, I don't think anybody's gonna buy that. Needless to say, there's a ton of stuff going on. But I don't care about any of that, because my friend Todd has a little demo to show you. Hi, I'm Todd Howard of Bethesda Softworks, and welcome to our demo of The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. So the E3 demo was just that. It was a demo. Some of the stuff in this demo was never intended to be part of the final game. Like this guy, Albin Corinus. He's just intended as a test character, and as a result, you can't find him anywhere in the game. Unless. Let's say a certain someone were to open up the command window, and let's say that certain someone were to type in COC test Todd crazy. Well then, a certain someone might find themselves in a certain testing room, and in that certain testing room, they might find a certain Albin Corinus. And wait until you hear his voice. What? That really pisses me off. Oh no, what do we do? I'm so scared. Yep, those silky tones are Todd Howard. I also like in this demo, when they pull the menu up, the character's got a ridiculous amount of health and magicka and fatigue. Like they didn't want the guy recording the demo to die, so they had to make sure it was nearly impossible. Another thing they do in this demo a few times is they show off the physics of the game, and how all the objects in the world can interact with each other, and how you can interact with them too. I think this was the craze among game developers at the time. Half-Life 2 came out the year before this E3, and it had all sorts of cool physics puzzles you could solve. I think Bethesda probably saw that and thought, oh cool, yeah, we'll take some of that. How about we just to slide on over to Half-Life 2, pick up some of the physics and then slide on back. And it was definitely something that was on gamers' minds too. This is a forum post from 2005 with different people discussing their hopes for the physics engine in the game. But the thing is, the physics never really ended up being a significant part of the game. There's a thing in the first dungeon where you can release a bunch of logs to roll down a hill, and there's the occasional boulder trap that you have to avoid. But in the numerous hours I've put into the game, I don't ever remember explicitly using the physics to achieve anything. You see, with Bethesda, and maybe with all games companies if you want to make that argument. There's a big difference between what they promise people at E3 and what actually ends up being in the game. And one thing that really shows that is Radiant AI. So Todd is presenting this thing called Radiant AI, which is Bethesda's shiny new proprietary system that allows NPCs to have their own schedules, routines, goals, ambitions, and lives without the need for any explicit scripting. It was a technology that was later adapted for Fallout 3, Skyrim, and the other big Bethesda RPGs since. Radiant AI was presented as this amazing way of creating realistic NPCs that made the world feel lived in. And now I want to make this clear. Bethesda didn't lie about Radiant AI per se. They just embellish the truth a little. Because while it's true NPCs do have their own schedules, they're not exactly what you would call normal. For example, let's pick an NPC at random. And I do mean that, I genuinely have picked this NPC at random. And let's look at what their schedule's like. So this is Casta Scribonia. She's an Imperial living in Chorl. She wakes up at 6am and she then wanders around her house for two hours. Then she'll leave her house and wander around Chorl, talking to other NPCs for four hours. Then she'll specifically seek out Oric Grigoth and talk to him before returning home and walking around again for two hours. Now after that, she'll go to the Mages Guild, talk to another NPC there and then eat at the Oak and Crozier, returns home, walks around for four more hours, goes to bed, and then wakes up the very next day and does it all over again. Can you imagine if that was someone's schedule in the real world? There are some cool ones though. There are characters that make occasional trips to other cities to meet their friends. There's this one woman in Anvil who cheats on her husband, like, all the time. And I mean, all the time. Seriously, you would have thought he would find out by now. I love the conversations that NPCs have with each other because they're so disjointed. They start talking about really serious topics and then just stop and walk away like nothing's happened. What's the news from the other parts of Tamriel? 
They say syndicates of wizards have led a boycott of Imperial goods in the land of the Ultima. The Ultima have powerful wizards. Could be a dangerous situation. Good day. I'm only asking for a single coin. They also love to completely shift their emotions depending on whether or not they're talking to you directly. What is it? Yes? Kudai is a member of Breville's Mages Guild. She put the word out that a good friend of hers went missing. She's offered a reward, but as far as I know, nobody's taken her up on the offer. Not sure who's missing either. She's keeping quiet about it. I suppose if you're interested, you could head... Stop talking. What? Of course, this odd NPC behavior doesn't limit itself to social interactions. Oh no, because it wouldn't be a Bethesda game without some Bethesda bugs. So there's this quest called the Wayward Knight where you go through an Oblivion Gate and you come across these two guys, Bremen and Farwell. Can't believe I remember their names without looking at the script. Farwell's the son of the Count of Chadenhall, who's the guy that asked you to close the gate and help his son escape. So essentially you've got to try and keep these two guys alive while you get the Sigil Stone. Easy, right? Nope. I kept on getting to this bridge with some Dramora on it, and Bremen and Farwell would just go straight for them, knock the Dramora off the bridge, and then go off the bridge after them, and die in the lava. And they did that five times! I kept on reloading a quick save to try and keep them alive, and eventually I got them into the tower and then they just died there. So I decided fuck it and I left them. It's their fault, really. At the end of the quest you go back to the Count to tell him of his son's fate, and you expect him to be sad about it. And he is. But kind of also not really. And then he does the classic Oblivion move. I do not blame you for my son's death. He brought that upon himself, as hard as it is for a father to admit. Since the immediate threat to Chadenhall is now eliminated, I will grant your request and send reinforcements to Bruma. I'm done talking to you. Another thing that makes Oblivion NPCs so, uh, unique, shall we say, is the voice acting. There are some big name actors in Oblivion, like Patrick Stewart and Sean Bean, but they only voice one character each. Most of the other NPCs across the world are played by the same few people. Like there's the Imperial Guard, who's played by Wes Johnson. Or the Arena Announcer, who's played by... Wes Johnson. Or Lucien Lachance, who's played by... Wes Johnson. You get the idea. And it's similar in Skyrim, you get recognisable voices all over the place. But the thing that's really weird about Oblivion is that so many of the voice lines just don't fit into the context at all. I'm only asking for enough to feed me kids. I saw Romalus Briant walking his dogs today, and yesterday, and the day before. I swear that's all he does. Apparently the main reason why the voice acting sounds like this is that all of the lines were recorded in alphabetical order, instead of, you know, doing it in a way that made sense. And all credit to the voice actors for still managing to do a pretty good job. But yeah, it can be weird sometimes. So obviously a key part of any RPG is its quests, and Oblivion has its fair share of great quests. Too many to list in detail, so I'll just give a brief overview of some of the ones that stood out to me. The first quest line that I completed was the Thieves Guild. The quests were decent, but what I really liked was the way that to get the next quest you had to fence a certain amount of gold. It meant that unlike Skyrim, I was regularly doing burglaries and utilising the fences throughout my playthrough. Even after completing the Thieves Guild quest line, I was still stealing stuff whenever I got the opportunity. But my favourite quest that I played so far is for the Dark Brotherhood, and it's it's called Who Done It. So in Who Done It, you get locked in a house with five other guests, and they all think that there's a chest hidden somewhere in the house. But you see, the thing is, there is no hidden chest. Instead, they've been locked in the house with you to kill them off one by one, and you have to make it so that no one suspects that you're the one doing the killing. This quest is great because there's loads of different ways that you can go about it. I managed to get three guests in a row when they were upstairs. Neville comes up to me and he's all like, You'd be smart to stay with the rest of the group. It's just not safe to go wandering off alone with a kid. 
It's really not safe to go wandering alone now, is it, Neville? I found out afterwards that I actually completed the quest really quickly, and there's this whole other side to it where you can get them to start suspecting each other, and you can basically just turn the whole party against each other. The most oblivion part of this quest is how the guests keep going to sleep at the party, even though they know that there's a murderer on the loose. All in all, it was the easiest game of Among Us that I've ever played. There are lots of quests with really creative writing like that. Like, for example, there's this other quest in Skingrad where this crazy guy gets you to follow people around the town because he's convinced that they're stalking him. Of course, there are some quests that I couldn't stand. I'm definitely not the first person on YouTube to complain about the Oblivion Gates, and I won't be the last. They're just so samey, and they take so long to do, and then you discover there's this one quest that makes you do like seven of them in a row, and that's the point that you figure out, hey, all I really need to do is grab that sigil stone, right? So then you grab some skooma, take off that heavy armor, and jump over all the enemies until you reach the top. Oblivion is broken and bizarre. There were numerous times that I had to go in the console and manually advance a quest because it glitched and it wouldn't go any further. NPC voice lines can be illogical and their actions can often be hilariously weird, but that's part of the charm. Beneath the memes and the ridiculousness is an immersive world that's genuinely fun to play in, with tons to do that I've barely even scratched the surface of in this video. The game may be dated now, but it sort of doesn't matter. The gaming industry moves so quickly that it doesn't take long for something to feel old. But this is a game that I feel like I can pick up and play all these years later without its age feeling like it's getting in the way too much. Essentially, I really like this game. The cities in Oblivion are great to walk around, and they're so massive they really do feel like cities. Sure, I guess they're a bit emptier than the ones in Skyrim, but that's never really bothered me. There are plenty of memorable moments, NPCs, locations, and quests. This game gets compared a lot to Skyrim. Some people think it's better, some people think it's worse, but ultimately, I've never really cared about making these sorts of comparisons. I've enjoyed both of them in their own right, and trying to decide which one is better doesn't really matter to me. So that's my look at Oblivion. I don't really have some big point to make. YouTube videos don't need to make big sweeping conclusions all the time, you know? I'm just a guy in my room talking about something I enjoy, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing me talk about it. If there's something you think I should cover next, let me know, and I'll see you next time.